Support for the Legislative Gazette comes from New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals standing with more than 600,000 workers in education, human services, and health care with the Our Voice, Our Values, Our Union campaign. And United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. Here, Governor Kathy Hochul is considering her options after members of her own Democratic Party in the Senate Judiciary Committee voted down her choice for the next chief judge of New York. The Legislative Gazette's Karen DeWitt reports. All in favor of advancing the nomination, Senator Thomas. Senator Sepulveda. Just two of 13 Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee voted for Hochul's nominee for Chief Judge Hector LaSalle following a five-hour hearing. Ten voted no, and one Democrat joined the six Republicans on the committee to vote to advance LaSalle's name, but without a recommendation. LaSalle, the presiding justice of a mid-level appeals court based in Brooklyn, was formerly an assistant district attorney on Long Island. Senate Majority Lee Leader Andrea Stort Cousins is ready to move on. She says the Senate has fulfilled its constitutional role in the confirmation process, and Governor Hochul needs to begin that process again and find a nominee that everyone can agree on. The nomination was lost, and uh, I'm hoping that we can move forward and really work to find the chief judge that is reflective of the majority of what the conference, what New Yorkers expect in a chief judge. But Hochul does not appear ready to leave the defeat behind. Speaking on Thursday, she says the vote was unfair because the outcome was predetermined after 14 Democratic senators said in advance that they would not back LaSalle because they viewed him as too conservative. And she says the deck was stacked against him after the Senate added four more members to the Judiciary Committee, three of whom said they they opposed LaSalle. I think if you look at the original composition of that committee before it was changed, there were enough votes to go forward. You'd have to question why there was unexpectedly four more votes added to that committee. Hochul believes that even though the committee rejected LaSalle, the state's constitution requires that the nominee face a floor vote by all 63 senators. Former Chief Judge Jonathan Littman, a supporter of LaSalle, agrees. This matter has to go to the Florida Senate by the constitution and by the enabling legislation, there's no question about it. Senate Leader Stuart Cousins says it should come as no surprise to the governor or to anyone else that some senators were opposed to the nominee. Twenty Democratic senators wrote Hochul a letter as early as last summer. They said they wanted her to choose someone who was not a former prosecutor and who would help change the direction of the increasingly conservative high court back to the left. Conference is looking for someone who would change the trajectory of the court. And that was stated even before this nominee. And Stuart Cousins says the Judiciary Committee was expanded because more senators were interested in joining it in the wake of recent controversial U.S. Supreme Court rulings. Hochul has indicated that she might take the matter to court to try to force a full Senate vote. The Buffalo News reports she's making arrangements to hire outside counsel to help with that effort. But Hochul says she hasn't yet decided. We're certainly weighing all of our options. I think yesterday was an opportunity for all New Yorkers to listen to an exceptionally qualified jurist. Judiciary Chair Brad Hoyleman Siegel says he, like the Senate leader, believes his House has fulfilled its constitutional duty. He says it would be a travesty for Hochul to launch a court battle. To have a, a constitutional crisis I, I, seems to be not in anyone's interest. The dispute comes as Hochul is preparing to detail her agenda, announced in her State of the State message earlier this month in her budget proposal. It includes plans to build 800,000 new housing units over the next several years, invest heavily in the mental health system, and link the state's minimum wage to the rate of inflation. Senator Hoyleman Siegel, along with the other Democrats in the chamber, say they strongly support those proposals, and they hope that the fight over the judge doesn't get in the way of a Achieving those goals. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt.
You are listening to the Legislative Gazette, a program about New York state government and politics. I'm David Gustina. When Governor Kathy Hochul unveils her budget plan in the coming days, the proposals will be closely watched by lawmakers, advocates, and good government groups. After the Democrat narrowly won a full term in November, it remains to be seen how she'll propose to fund her agenda, especially given the warnings about economic uncertainty on the horizon. One group that works to change the culture in state government is Reinvent Albany. Executive Director John Caney spoke with Legislative Gazette political observer Alan Shartok. We need uh, Reinvent Albany times a thousand, but not just our group. It needs to be many, many more people. The, um, the state of New York has serious, serious problems, and they're structural, including uh, real issues with uh, lots and lots of people leaving upstate, and that's just happening and continues to happen. Um, the state has a very, very high tax burden compared to the services it delivers, so that you know we're spending roughly 200 billion a year uh, at the state level now and delivering um, transit service and social services that are lacking for New York. And as you know, our group would feel it as we have you know Western European style taxes without Western European style services. Or um, and so New York spends a ton. New York's Medicaid system is is. Uh, incredibly expensive and the the poster child for uh, ridiculously overly hospitalized expensive end-of-life care and we have incredible issues with poverty that are essentially not dealt with despite spending humongous humongous amounts of money so if you're someone who thinks it's good to dump huge amounts of money into producing fairly crummy public services then you know god bless but we're not and that's what so we would like so you know should it should it be reinvent albany doing everything hell no i mean it takes it takes a ton of people but um but we think new york state has awesome awesome potential and dynamism and is pretty terrible governance overall in terms of pouring money into the machine and getting uh good services out of the bottom well, John Caney, uh, one of the things that is interesting to me is your groups coming back and back and back to government transparency. How does New York shape up compared to other governments, the national government, uh, the other state governments? Is New York really uh, something that is so non-transparent that we have to put this emphasis on it? Yeah, I, the, I, we wish we didn't have to spend so much time on basic transparency, especially in the Internet age where you can just put so much online. But the sad reality is, is that New York's um, pretty secretive and opaque. And our budget process in particular, is, as you well know, and many people gripe about, mm. is often mysterious. And you have billions of dollars spent on things and legislators voting at the last second on things they don't know about. Um, and we have the entire big, ugly process of legislating and budgeting in which you, it's very leadership oriented and there's not a lot of uh, robust public hearing so people know what's going on plus on a you know when we use the word transparency it's often equated with freedom of information law um, which is just a part of transparency but new york's freedom of information system is is totally broken it's overwhelmed with massive amounts of requests and government uh, from local county clerks all the way up to, you know, big state public authorities are, are grossly underfunded uh, to deal with the public uh, freedom of information requests. And on top of it, uh, officials often, you know, deliberately do not want to reveal things because they're embarrassing. And so, um, so New York is terrible compared to the federal government, which is when it comes to transparency. That's reInvent Albany Executive Director John Caney speaking with Legislative Gazette political observer Alan Chartoff.
are listening to the Legislative Gazette, a program about New York state government and politics. I'm David Gustina. Developers of new RSV immunizations say the FDA is now officially reviewing the product for approval. The years-long process that could put the product on shelves by the next RSV season began with twin baby girls in Syracuse. Reporting for the Legislative Gazette, WAER's Taryn Mento explains. The second pregnancy for Cheryl Meany quickly turned from joyful to terrifying. I can't even describe to you what this pregnancy was. It was difficult for Cheryl to even get pregnant after her first daughter. So the news she was carrying twins had her ecstatic. But that changed when doctors raised concern after concern. They were telling us they could potentially have like lesions on their brain. So when Cheryl was just a few months pregnant and her husband suggested they enroll the twins in a study for an experimental RSV immunization, she needed a moment to process. Like, what are you even talking about? I don't even know what you're asking me right now. That was December 2014, eight years before this latest RSV surge overwhelmed hospitals across the country. But even back then, Cheryl was worried. She had seen multiple friends with kids in the hospital for RSV or respiratory syncytial virus. What do you do when your kid is hooked, you know, just in the hospital struggling to breathe and like hooked up to IVs? But the study presented Cheryl with something she could do. So she said yes. And her decision helped move forward one of the most promising RSV immunizations in decades. RSV is the number one reason why infants and young children are hospitalized, not just in the U.S., but across the world. Dr. Joe Domakowski at Upstate Medical University led the hospital's recent COVID vaccine trial for kids. But for years, he's worked with AstraZeneca on a monoclonal antibody for RSV. That's like a ready-made immune defense. And he injected Cheryl's daughters with it in January 2015, making them the first babies in the world to ever receive it. I started it myself. It was great fun. He says starting the study with the twin babies was a significant moment after researchers had struggled for years to find success. Back in the 1960s, an experimental vaccine actually made kids get sicker from RSV. It really charged up the wrong half of the um, immune system. Two babies died because of it. Domakowski says progress didn't come until two decades later, in 1998. The FDA okayed a monoclonal antibody for premature and high-risk babies. But Domakowski says medical guidelines have severely limited the babies that are eligible. And, he says, its efficacy isn't that great. It has to be given monthly, and it's um, effective at preventing um, hospitalization, not effective at preventing infection. That's where we'd been stuck for years until 2014 when Domakowski attended a medical conference in Argentina and a featured speaker dropped a massive discovery that a lot of RSV research was focusing on the wrong protein. Everyone is just sitting there staring with their mouths gaping open. It's like this is why all of our work hasn't led to anything for decades. It was that impressive. And you could see the pharma people that were attending, taking notes, calling their colleagues, saying, stop the, you know, stop the work. Not too long later, he was injecting Cheryl's daughters with an updated one-shot monoclonal antibody known as Nircevimab. Hi, what's your name? My name Cassidy. is Stella. You're Stella? And Cassidy you are, and Stella just turned eight. Right now. Where are you going after this? To Ninja. They like to compete in Ninja Warrior contests, obstacle courses of ladders, monkey bars, and overturned BOSU balls. So I have to bounce onto this one like this. Cheryl says the trial was such a positive experience, the twins even chose to join Domakowski's later trial for a kid's COVID vaccine. She says the girls never had complications from Nirsevimab, and no, they never got RSV. But they did get a spot in medical history when she says AstraZeneca asked to use their photos for research papers. And I think at that point I was like, wow, I mean, this matters. And this matters for kids everywhere, not just kids here and not just kids in the United States. Domakowski says it's likely the girls got RSV in later seasons, but symptoms weren't noticeable. AstraZeneca says it's near Sevamab decreased severe RSV infections by about 75%. Domakowski expects a green light by spring and for Nirsevimab to be on shelves before the next RSV season begins in the fall. It was already approved in Europe. That's WAER's Taryn Mento reporting for the Legislative Gazette. Amazon has been cited by the federal government for workplace safety violations at three of its warehouses. As the Legislative Gazette's Lucas Willard reports, one facility cited is located in Orange County and another in Rensselaer County is being investigated. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration announced citations Wednesday for Amazon distribution centers in New Windsor, New York, Florida, and Illinois. 
The facilities were inspected as part of an ongoing probe into the retailer's safety practices in conjunction with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. OSHA Assistant Secretary Doug Parker outlined the citations in a call with reporters. Our investigations determined warehouse workers are required to perform tasks at a fast pace, including manually lifting items from trailers, removing packages from a conveyor and stacking them from floor to ceiling, and other tasks that require workers to work in awkward positions that make them prone to injuries. These tasks, when performed up to nine times a minute for hours at a time in some facilities, puts Amazon workers at a high risk of musculoskeletal injuries. Pointing to OSHA's DART rate, which provides an index of recordable workplace injuries, Parker said Amazon's national injury rate is 9 per 100 workers. The national average for warehouse workers is 4.7 per 100 workers. The DART rate at the New Windsor facility is 14.7 per 100. DART stands for Days Away, Restricted, and Transfer. Injury rates like this should get a company's attention and they should be working proactively to understand the root causes of those injuries and address them. And yet Amazon continues to operate business as usual, creating unsafe work environments and failing to protect its employees. Citations totaling more than $60,000 were issued for violations of the General Duty Clause in the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Inspections for the three facilities cited on Wednesday were performed in July of last year. Similar inspections took place at other facilities, including Amazon's ALB1 facility in Skodak in August, where workers unsuccessfully sought to unionize two months later. Attorney Seth Goldstein, who was representing the Amazon Labor Union, was not surprised by Wednesday's announcement. It confirms what we've been saying all along, that this is the 220. Uh, 2023rd version of the Toronto Shirt Waste Factory that um, every day there is some type of human rights violation as far as safety is concerned for employees. We have um, our own OSHA um, charges in with the uh, Department of Labor for ALB1, and we also have retaliation charges under OSHA at JFK8. Employees at ALB1 made health and safety a focus in their push for unionization. Speaking with WAMC in October during a rally outside the Rensselaer County facility, employee Sam Mollick, who was on workers' compensation leave after a head injury, said his complaints went unheard. All they tell you is, oh, we're working on it, we're working on it, we're working on it. Well, okay, it's been a month and a half. Why isn't that fire extinguisher replaced? All right, you, I told you, you know, three weeks ago about hard hats, and I just got injured, and there's still no hard hats here. Amazon rejected OSHA's findings and said it would appeal. The retailer said in a statement it takes the safety and health of its employees very seriously. Amazon spokesperson Kelly Nantel said the retailer has cooperated fully, adding the charges brought by OSHA do not reflect the reality of safety at our sites. Nantel said the company has reduced injury rates by 15 percent between 2019 and 2021 and that it plans to share during its appeal its numerous safety innovations, process improvements and investments to further reduce injuries, adding Amazon will never stop working to be safer for its employees. Meantime, lawyers for ALU workers at JFK 8 on Staten Island are ready for Amazon to come to the bargaining table. The company had objected to the union vote last spring until the results were upheld earlier this month by the National Labor Relations Board. Again, attorney Seth Goldstein. The game is over. You need to come to the table and bargain in good faith like you're required to under the law. For the Legislative Gazette, I'm Lucas Willard. Listening to the Legislative Gazette, program about New York State government and politics. I'm David Gustina. Authorities in Rensselaer County say they've cracked a 28-year-old murder case. The Legislative Gazette's Dave Lucas has details. On August 19, 1994, 
Wilhelmina Filkins was found dead in her Coventry Lane apartment by relatives who went to check on her. The 81-year-old, known as Violet, was a robbery victim who investigators say had died two days earlier after being struck on the head. The investigation, spanning nearly three decades, saw officers check out more than 2,000 leads, conducting multiple interviews of neighbors and suspects, including a then 18-year-old Columbia High graduate who lived in the same apartment complex. Originally from Minnesota, Jeremiah Guyette was never a person of interest and moved to Red Hook shortly after the murder. He enlisted in the U.S. Air Force and was stationed in Florida. After he was discharged, Guyette eventually settled in Rosendale, where investigators interviewed him October 1, 2019, telling Guyette they needed to talk about something that had happened 25 years ago. East Greenbush Detective Sergeant Michael Guadagnino. Guyette became defensive, visibly upset, and stated he would not speak to us without an attorney. On that day, investigators continued conducting extensive interviews of family members, co-workers, and friends of Jeremiah. The next morning at approximately 7.30, uh, which would have been October 2nd, 2019, New York State Police Kingston, uh, who cover the area of Rosendale where Jeremiah lived, were called to Jeremiah's residence for a report of gunshots. Investigation revealed that Jeremiah was found deceased in his garage from an apparent gunshot wound to the head. On October 4th, an autopsy was conducted and the cause of death was suicide by self-inflicted gunshot wound. At this point, Postmortem fingerprints and DNA were obtained from Jeremiah and submitted to the New York State Police for further comparison to the original evidence in the case. Over the course of the next few months, multiple leads, which stemmed from previous interviews that day, were followed up on by investigators. Guadagnino says the major break came in April 2019 with a tip from an ex-girlfriend. The acquaintance shared that approximately in 2009, uh, August of 2009, Jeremiah had started crying at their home and made statements such as, that poor old woman, I robbed her, I hit her and I just left her there. This can't be true, I'm sure she's fine. As forensic technology advanced, investigators were able to put all the pieces of the cold case together, confirming a thumbprint found on a coffee table in Filkin's living room matched Guyette's. A family member who lives out of state came forward, saying she had received a text message from Guyette the day police questioned him. She first received a text message that he wanted to speak to her about an incident, and then a follow-up call, which was corroborated with Jeremiah's phone records, that the family member lived out of state and was planning a trip to New York. And when speaking with her, Jeremiah said he might not be around when she arrived here on the trip. He further stated that he was younger, and a long time ago, he had planned to steal a car and rob a bank to get money for college. He then stated someone had died, but he didn't want to talk anymore over the phone. He further stated to the family member that he didn't want to go to prison and was in a panic. At this time, the family member helped him make arrangements to meet with an attorney on October 2nd, 2019. Uh, that was corroborated through the attorney. And then on October 2nd, 2019, Jeremiah took his own life. Guadagnino says the case was solved through collaboration by police agencies over the decades. Rensselaer County District Attorney Mary Pat Donnelly says the case carries an important lesson. That we need to work with our law enforcement, we need to cooperate and we need to share so that we can keep each other safe. The fact that a tragedy of this magnitude happened in this town, which I promise all of you is a safe place to live, is evidence that can happen anywhere. And we all have to be on alert. And when we do know something, we have to come forward to law enforcement and share what we know. Filkin's niece, Carol, was one of the relatives who found Violet's body. All the remaining family is extremely impressed with the persistence of law enforcement and the, the work and coordination done on behalf of my aunt's um, case and the fact that we've gotten this far and gotten to, to not only uh, identified the person, but then we're able to have the hard and fast evidence to support the case. For the Legislative Gazette, I'm Dave Lucas.
And that about does it for this week's show. We had help from the New York State Public Radio Network. For copies, call 1-800-323-9262. That's 1-800-323-9262. Ask for program number 2303. Or just listen online at wamc.org or schedule a podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And join us again next week at this same time for more news on New York State government and politics. For the Legislative Gazette, I'm David Gustina.